Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video we will be talking and learning about two methods used in destructive material testing. With the help of these test methods we will see how different lattice types influence the properties of materials. During destructive material testing materials are physically destroyed. After testing the tested component cannot be used any longer. I would just like to show you the two most important testing methods, the tensile test and the Sharpie impact test. The tensile test is carried out with a standardized tensile testing machine. The tensile test is the most important method in material testing since it determines the most essential characteristic values of a material such as yield strengths, tensile strengths, modulus of elasticity and elongation. A standardized sample of the material is clamped between two clamping fixtures and the sample is stretched at a standardized speed. The force F, which the sample resists the forced extension, is plotted in a graph against elongation delta L of the sample. If a tensile test is carried out on a structural steel, in addition to the elastic elongation, a permanent elongation of the sample suddenly occurs at a certain stress. Thus, FEH, shown in the diagram, decreases since the resisting force of the sample suddenly decreases. After exceeding this yield point area, the sample elongates more and more as the force increases. At a specific maximum force FM in the diagram, the sample begins to neck, as we can see in this sample. Here the force decreases and finally the sample breaks. To obtain characteristic values of the material, rather than only information about the forces that a certain sample can withstand, the forces and the changes in length must be put in relation to the tensile test sample's geometric data. Thus, the tensile stress, sigma, is determined by the ratio of the force F to the original cross-section of the sample S0. The strain epsilon, that is the relative change in length in percent, is determined by the ratio of the increase of the sample's gauge length delta L to the original gauge length L0 times 100%. If we plot the calculated stress against the strain, we obtain the stress-strain diagram. Under low stress, many materials behave purely elastic. This means that the deformation is reversible and the material returns to its original state when the force is removed. In the stress-strain diagram, this range is depicted as a curve moving up in a straight sloped line in the range of a lower strain, the so-called Hooke's straight line. Normally structures are designed in such a way that the load they are subjected to remains within this pure elastic range. The slope of Hooke's straight line corresponds to the modulus of elasticity, E, the so-called Young's modulus, which is a measure of a material's stiffness. The maximum force Fm shown in the stress-strain diagram divided by the original cross-section of the sample S0 equals to the tensile strength Rm. If we take a look at the behavior of the stress in the stress-strain diagram, we will recognize point Reh as an upper yield strength and point Rel as a lower yield strength. If the test material doesn't show a clear yield strength, that is, there is not a distinct drop in the stress at the end of Hooke's straight line, the so-called 0.2% RP 0.2 offset yield strength 
also called proof stress, is determined. According to the standard, the yield strength of 0.2% is graphically determined by a line parallel to Hooke's straight line at a distance of 0.2% from the original gauge length. The point of intersection with the stress strain diagram is a stress RP 0.2. To determine the elongation at break A, the broken sample is put back together precisely. Based on the original length, the elongation percentage is then determined. Besides the mechanical characteristics resulting from the tensile test, we often need the results of the Sharpie impact test in order to determine the right material for a specific application. The use of materials that don't meet the requirements can have fatal consequences. When coldness and strong forces impacts are combined, some steels become brittle and breaks. This is why numerous power transmission towers collapsed in Germany during the very cold and snowy winter in 2005. Like the tensile test, the Sharpie impact test is also a destructive material test method. This test method provides information about the material's resistance to sudden stress. The toughness depends on three factors, temperature, notched form and the material's composition or the resulting lattice structure. The specimens that are used for the Sharpie impact test are 55 mm long and they have a quadratic cross-section of 10 times 10 square millimeters. The specimens are notched for a better control of the fracture process. Two different notched shapes can be used, V-shaped notched and U-shaped notch. Since the toughness of a material also depends on the temperature, specimens are brought to a desired temperature in a climatic cabinet and then removed immediately before the test. The specimen is then placed with a notch in the direction of impact in the pendulum impact tester and the pendulum is released. If the pendulum punctures the specimen, a portion of its kinetic energy will be absorbed by the deformation process. Therefore, the pendulum doesn't swing that high on the other side. The difference between the initial and the final height of the pendulum determines the notch bar impact work of a specimen. The notch bar impact work is given in Joule and can be read from the scale on the testing device. Some metal materials, for example structural steel with BCC lattices, tend to become brittle at low temperatures. If such materials are tested with a Sharpie impact test at low temperatures, the result is a brittle fracture. The specimen has a smooth fracture and the fracture surface has a microcrystalline appearance. Ductile materials deform first before breaking. You can recognize such ductile fracture by their deformed edges. There are, however, also specimens that exhibit both microcrystalline areas as well as deformed spots. This type is called a mixed fracture. Since notch bar impact work strongly depends on the temperature, the measured values are plotted against the temperature. The energy absorbed temperature curve can be divided into three sections. Upper shelf, transition zone and lower shelf. The upper shelf shows a good toughness at high temperatures. Ductile fractures occur in the upper shelf. The lower shelf shows a lower notch toughness values at low temperatures. The material had a, has a smooth fracture. That is to say, this leads to brittle fracture. The transition zone shows the transition range between upper and lower shelf. The measured values are scattered extensively in the transition zone. Mixed fractures occur here. As you have learned in the last video, the difference between face-centered cubic metals and body-centered cubic metals exhibit itself especially at temperature-dependent impact stress. The resistance to slip increases sharply with decreasing temperature, especially in metals that don't have close-packed slip planes. After evaluating the tests carried out with varied test temperatures, we can obtain clear indications 
of a possible transition temperature Tt. Since knowledge of the transition temperature from ductile to brittle material behavior can be of vital importance to the material selection, both the temperature as well as the value obtained for the notched bar impact work, in our example Ku equals 27 Joule, are specified in the materials designation, especially when it comes to structural steel. In the next video, designation of steels, we will see how this works. Thanks for watching.